Good afternoon, morning or night, wherever and whenever you are. Welcome back to another episode of Text2, the show that discusses the best of everything technology, computers, home theater, gaming, science, and more. And uh, with me today is Dylan, and I am Mark Murin, and we're Hello. back. How's it going? we got some PS4 excitement to talk about today, of course, and... Uh, just a couple of quick news stories, and we'll just jump right into that and and uh, jump in and see what's cooking in the text to this week and fire up the top news stories. Program complete. Enter when ready. Complete. Enter when ready. Yeah, first up, we got Google announcing the 1299 Chromebook. It's called the Pixel, and it has a uh, 2560 by 1700 3 by 2 uh, touchscreen, which is 12.85 inches, I believe. Uh, Core i5 CPU, a terabyte of Google uh, Drive storage comes with that, an optional LTE, and a uh, pretty, pretty expensive uh, 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 unit at that price. The... Uh, you, you get the free terabyte of Google Drive space when you buy the device. Of course, there's two models, a 32 gig Wi-Fi model for 1300 and a 64 gig Verizon LTE for 1450. Chromebook Pixel is to have integrated Quick Office and open docs natively. So there you go, 1300 bucks for a netbook, which seems a little bit ridiculous to me anyway. And considering that you can buy um, other devices that can do the same thing for a lot cheaper. However, the resolution is pretty good at 2560 by 1700 but for that price, you could probably get two smaller net-type books a lot cheaper. And in the other news, the um, flexible patent was filed for Apple. Um, Apple Insider discovered an Apple patent application which backed up the idea of Apple working on a watch. The Buy Stable Spring with flexible display was filed in August 2011 describing a wearable wrist device that uses Bluetooth or Wi-Fi to show info from another device on a flexible display. That wraps around the user's wrist. Essentially a watch. A eye watch, if you will. And uh, that, so that holds up some of the stories about the the iWatch coming, so you have the Google Glass glasses and an iWatch to look at things too. Lots of options out there. But the big news, of course, we're talking about gaming consoles and the PS4 conference that just happened not too long ago. Two hours of talk, and we could play a little clip here. Uh, the beginning of this uh, uh, PS4 announcement we have here streaming. Let me just switch it over here. The stakes are high for what we're going to show you. Today marks a moment of truth and a bold step forward for PlayStation as a company, as creators and innovators, and as industry leaders. At Sony, we've always talked about our entire portfolio of technology and content, blockbuster titles, and successful entertainment franchises. Today, we'll show you how we're strengthening the PlayStation ecosystem through hardware, software, and network capabilities that, when unified, create truly magical experiences that can only be found in our world. We'll show you how we're making access... Or an alternative dimension, perhaps. ...social interactions and titles vastly more simplified and streamlined. And we'll show you the many ways in which the living room is no longer the center of the PlayStation ecosystem the gamer is. But we won't show you the actual system, of course. We've created a platform attuned to consumers' changing behaviors and an evolving sense of play. Ease of access, regardless of location or device, has been an absolute priority. With mobility and the ability to share content and experiences becoming an increasingly important part of the gaming experience, connectivity between devices and the ease with which they connect has been essential to meeting the demands of today's casual or core gamer. So, of course, they um, go on to 
finally give some stats on the PS4 spec information and lots of demo videos of games to come and and uh, but no PS4 we have an entire two-hour set dedicated to talking about a brand new console without actually showing a console which may seem a little eh. ridiculous. <laughs> I don't know. On the other hand, what do you want to see? Like a box? You can just put a box up on the screen. Yeah, they could have just shown a box, I suppose. But we get, we got to see the uh, the PS4 um, controller. Yeah, I mean, you know, no doubt. But it's, ob I mean, you know, the thing you need to realize is it's not released yet. It's the better part. I mean, it's almost like a full year away, practically speaking. So, you yeah. know, they're probably still finalizing the industrial design of the... Uh, of the console. Obviously they did the controller first, which kind of makes sense. It's kind of a it's smaller setup. Like I think when you look at the console, they're probably still finalizing a lot of things, seeing what makes sense, you know. Um, you know, they're putting custom chips in it, so they're probably still hammering out all the details on that. Uh, you know, just stuff like that. So they're... I don't know. I'm not terribly surprised they didn't show it. I appreciate that people want it, but when you think of it, at the end of the day, the actual plastic case is going to be one of the last things to be designed, and ultimately, when that's pretty much when that pretty much when that's done, it, it's going to be out the door, you know. Yeah, and well, uh, looking at it on paper, it, it looks pretty good. Uh, on the screen here, you can see the uh, the specs. Um, they have a custom processor, the AMD Jaguar with eight cores. And 1.8 teraflops computing power GPU AMD next generation Radeon based GPU. It's not an APU, it's a separate GPU and CPU. GDDR5, 8 gigs of memory on the device. We've got a Blu ray, 6x, DVD, 8x, super speed USB. And you've got your HDMI, analog AV out, digital output and the of course the network bluetooth and bgn on the wireless side of things but the gpu is being compared to that of a 7850 uh, amd 7850 similar compute power but because they have a separate gpu and cpu the gpu can help where the cpu might need a little help for non-graphical compute power at least that's the um, speculation I, I think I think you're mistaken there, Mark. It is a single chip. It is a single chip? I thought yep, there were two it's separate. A no, oh, yeah, single is, single chip custom processor. Yeah, yeah, it is an APU. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, which is why they only give one RAM spec, because otherwise they'd probably be talking about splitting the RAM. But, um, ah, yeah, yes, 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 yeah. Yeah, single, si single chip APU. So APU meaning um, combined. So they are going the APU route with that guy. And the um, uh, the PS3, if you compare it to the PS3 specs at the time of release and and still today, I guess uh, PS3 using a cell microprocessor, which was made up of one 3.2 gigahertz PowerPC based power processing element and six accessible synergistic processing elements, and um, it had a, a PlayStation 3 cell CPU was up to 230 gigaflops and, and operations and up to um, and that's for uh, what is that for double precision single precision floating point 100 gigaflops I think I have no wait that's backwards sorry the first number is is uh, single precision 230 gigaflops and in double precision 100 gigaflops and it had 256 megabytes of RAM back in the PS3. And it was comparable to, at the time, a G70 GPU. Uh, or roughly that of, say, an NVIDIA 7800 just before that, I believe. 7900 was released in 2006. 7800 in early 2006. So somewhere between a 7800 and a 7900. Man, here we come with the PS4 equivalent to that of a. Just, set. Uh, just noticing something. Is it is the PS3 is comparable to Nvidia 7900, and the PS4 is the Radeon 8 7900? Uh, 7850. Yeah, I'll on close the PS4. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's true. just. I just think it's kind of funny the way the parts yeah, yeah. numbers changed. And Except uh, they're two different, two different 
manufacturers. Well, yeah, so. obviously they're not obviously, but yeah, I just thought that was kind of a a funny little coincidence there. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, but uh, so they're doing the APU route, which is the same thing that Microsoft did in 2010 with the Xbox 360. But the AMD's current top end APU uh, delivers only 700 gigaflops of compute power from CPU and GPU combined. But of course, the PS4's APU processor combination delivers two teraflops. Well, they're, they're stating in the Engadget article that the PS4's processor is delivering nearly two teraflops from the GPU alone. So yeah, the uh, 1.78, I thought it was. Let me just see real quick. Um, you know, 1.84. I don't know where I got 78 from. Um, 1.84 teraflops does seem to be the theoretical peak of the GPU alone. Um, don't know, obviously, the speed of the uh, the APU processor cores, but you know, figuring it's a gigahertz, you're probably looking at. Oh, man, it's it's hard to say. You're probably looking at maybe another. 32 gigaf gigaflops. I mean, you know, CPUs don't really pound out as much performance, so it's kind of it's kind of a drop in the bucket when it comes to CPUs. Well, at um, any well, at any rate, yeah, it's yeah. gonna it's gonna add up, and they're gonna they're gonna try to keep it under 599, according to Sony, and the uh, 499 was one of the many starting prices for the PS3, de depending on which model you got. I think there was a bigger uh, hard drive version that was 64 gig that was like 599 but 499 for one of the models so they're trying to do it for under 599 all that in one little box still doesn't compare to a high-end PC gaming rig but that's always been the case unfortunately but yeah I mean I would say it's in noteworthy for the fact that it compares to a quite high-end, honestly, um, PC from probably mm, sometime last year. Um, so it's going to be hitting, when it's released, probably still above mid-range PC, which is pretty remarkable for um, a console. I mean, when you consider just the joke of 256... or Sorry, 512, 256 would be awesome. 512... Um, Mega RAM in the PS3. I mean, you know, that didn't come out like a million years ago. Uh, the, we were probably we were still looking at, you know, two gig of system RAM in a in almost a normal computer at that point in 2006, um, late 2006. So, you know, they're actually it, it's worth noting that they're targeting a a mid range PC for this, um, if not better than that, which is going to certainly be positive for a lot of things, both in terms of like your PC games which are glorified console ports will at least be um, much more capable. Um, you know, obviously it'll give a lot more options. And you know, always keep in mind that it's kind of unfair to look at a game and uh, look at a console and say, oh well this sucks compared to my desktop, because do remember that your desktop is running Windows and running Windows drivers and running antivirus and anti-spyware um, and all that sort of stuff so what a game console can do with a given system specification is a hell of a lot more I mean you just look at what the PS3 has to offer and look at what the games it can put out are um, it's relatively impressive given the very weak specifications of that of that console you know so realistically probably overall performance wise it's going to be when it's released comparable to all but the highest end enthusiast PC in terms of just what it can do oh, yeah, no doubt I mean you got a gaming console puts it on your big screen without having to go through the hassle of sending HDMI cords everywhere through your walls and stuff like I do actually <laughs> from my gaming rig and then using you know Xbox 360 controllers to work through the walls or work remotely from 20 feet across the room uh, and get all that working under windows yeah it's a pretty it's a pretty awesome thing it's yeah you know and, and that's what I'm saying like so the kernel is the kernel is basically the game so there's not all that overhead and you know the drivers are basically they're all tuned to not offer like 
you know, your your DirectX games have to be possible to run like other DirectX applications in the background. You know, in theory, the, the sound driver has to support like other things running and stuff running in the background. Um, all sorts of services. You've got all the network stuff, which PS3 is now offloaded onto a separate chip. So, you know, just when you consider what all is going on, like the a game can really max out the resources available on a console, whereas on a PC you can't really muster quite as much uh, gas out of it. So, uh, I, you know, I think people give consoles a kind of a bum rap for um, bad specs when realistically the specs don't need to be quite as good because um, they don't have all the same issues the desktop has. Yeah, it's... Um it's looking pretty promising. I'm still excited about the Xbox, the next Xbox as well, too. Uh, but the PS4 looks more interesting to me than the PS3 did, especially if they get things right this time. But um, there's uh, they got the P the Vita streaming your your PS4 to the Vita, which is interesting, and that's certainly going to put a crimp on the Wii U kind of thing you know, with uh, games being streamed to... Well, I think that one advantage the Wii U is going to have there is um, the fact that its little handheld is going to be a lot cheaper than a Vita is. Oh yeah, um, definitely. Like, as the parody the parody video you found was, was like, oh, and buy a Vita, please. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, um... Yeah, there's a like, really... Just to let everybody know that there's a really funny parody video out there on YouTube if you haven't already seen it. Uh, we won't play it today, but um, it's it's worth checking out if you look for um, the three-minute... What's it called? The three-minute um, summary in three minutes. They don't actually call it a parody, but it's a parody. So check, check it out. It's pretty funny. It has an English accent. You'll know which one, or Australian... You'll know which one you found once you play it. But yeah, so, so, yeah, I mean, I, I only see the Vita thing as something for enthusiasts that are going to have it anyway. It's a little bonus points. I don't... I, I would be surprised if there's enough content out there that makes enough use of it to justify its purchase um, amongst people that wouldn't want to be buying one anyway. Um, just because, you know, I think most people that aren't interested in one or happy enough with their cell phone games, obviously, and I don't really see a whole lot of people who are in a position to say, well, I kind of like a Vita, but I only like four games on it, and I'd want to have, like, you know, six games before I'd buy it, because, you know, keep in mind that when you buy a console, you have to buy games for it, too, so, you know, you're putting a big investment in just so you can spend more money, and, um, so, yeah, I just can't really see it as something that's really going to help move those new, uh, be uh, be that deal breaker let's put it that way that um sort of tips the scales in towards in terms of buying one yeah so we've also got um uh, the um, sony moving away from the cell architecture trying to make developers have an easier time of creating games unlike the ps3 and uh, keep the cost down so that's a that's a change and they have the uh um, i forget how you pronounce this thing the Gakai, Gakai streaming service that Sony recently purchased. Uh, um, if we can go the back PS4. to the, uh, the cell for a second. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it's worth pointing out the fact that it's not really so much Sony going away from the cell so much as the fact that AMD did the cell right. Um, I mean, when you look at what they're putting in it, they're putting in a chip that has what? Um, let me see. Uh, search 18 compute units and 8 cores in it. What was the cell? It had 2 processor cores or something, right? And 8 um, streaming processor units. So basically they had something that was designed a lot like this chip, which is something that had, you know, a couple main processor cores and then a bunch of assistant sort of stream processor cores that like a GPU has. So, really, at this point, they've reinvented the cell in terms of the APU here, where you have your main processor cores and where you have your assistant streaming cores. Um, and obviously, those streaming cores do have dual purpose in terms of rendering, but 
realistically, I have a hard time believing that many games are going to use those entirely for rendering and not for physics and cloth simulation. It just doesn't really make that much sense. There's a lot of extra performance there um, available that you don't really need it for rendering and, um, you know, stuff like better physics and better cloth and better hair, you know, that's going to be worth a couple of compute units. So when you kind of look at the overall system architecture, they've really basically just gone with the core part, the, the cell part two. It's just that the design is far better and now what people are more used to. Um, with API that people are used to and with the same limitations that people are used to and not having to deal with cells weird um, eccentricities now you can basically move this over to a desktop because it's basically the same design um, so I think that's I think it's kind of um, disingenuous to say that the cell architecture is dead it's just that AMD did such a better job of designing it than um, Sony did and so yeah they've they've gone away from the cell but they've actually kept the same concept and realistically the world is actually moving towards that architecture yeah and in fact uh, one of uh, gaming history uh, best programmers John Carmack said in an interview with PC Perspective last year that the AMD fusion style chip architecture is almost a foregone conclusion for the future of computing so he I guess backs it up too with that mentality. Yeah. So, that's... I mean, I, I just I thought that's worth pointing out when everyone's all like, oh, they built on the cell. It's like, well, they just had they just had the idea of the cell before its time. Um, and in the intervening years, AMD basically took the same idea and um, put it together a lot better. And now Sony's right back at the cell, but everyone's criticizing them for it and not realizing the fact that this is just essentially the ultimate realization of what they were trying to accomplish with the cell processor. Yeah, I, I wanted to move on to the part of the, uh, the PS4 and using the, uh, the Move controller, the medium molecule tech demo that they demonstrated, and we can probably play a, a clip of it here. The, um, the, they're calling the PS4 the creative console, and Media Molecule showed off two tech demos aimed at demonstrating new ideas at the little big at the little big planet developed focused around uh, player created content and motion control tools that you can craft things using the motion controller, which sounds like it could be kludgy, but um, there is the the demo here. Let's see uh, see if this will play. Hold on one second. Let me make sure I bring it back up here. You're great. PlayStation 4. We are going to marry you with the power of the PlayStation 4. We are going to revolutionize making. You're great. So one of the first things we built with this was a sculpting tool. And we've been using it for a while now. Once we stop thinking in terms of memory budgets, schedules, pixels, we forgot about... So we can build clay trees, apparently. Just ...sketching. Put that at the heart of our creative process. A really lovely thing happened. We started having real fun, making, collaborating, sketching, remaking. It doesn't matter where you start out because you can take a left turn at any time that inspiration strikes and go somewhere even cooler. It's a free-form creative journey that I think of a little bit like cloud watching, except that you can reach in at any time and change and shape it to whatever's in your head. Behind me, you can see a time-lapse of one of our sculpts playing back literally as it was made because we record every single move that you make. And because it's such a quick and freeform thing, before we knew it at Media Molecule, we had made hundreds of these things. Imagine this multiplied from our tiny staff to the thousands and millions of brilliant PlayStation users online. Every single one of these was made entirely with the Move controller. And it's a kind of performance. If you aren't watching the actual video cast, he's showing uh, sculpting, 3D sculpting, kind of like 3D Max style, how they're using the Move controller to actually do the 3D sculpting the 2D fiddly camera controls and nasty user interface, it makes 3D sculpting easy for beginners and deep for advanced creators. And if you're like me and haven't quite mastered sculpture yet, then we're going to allow you to use the creativity of all of these people to collage and create ever larger sets, game levels, stories, with the really... The game level creation, which s sounds interesting if it actually works well. Of course, 
this isn't just about sculpture and collage. With, with PlayStation 4, with the creative console, we wanted to change making in every way, whether it's music, gaming, or storytelling. And the point is, it's fast to create. What you're about to see was recorded live in one take. It's someone's dream brought to life with PlayStation 4. Probably a professional did it. That's why it was so quick. A bunch of characters dancing around a guitar. Probably took four days to create, but they created it. Pixar. So there you go. That's Media Molecule and their uh, creation uh, tool that they're going to have with the, uh, the PS4 using the Move controller, which is built in to the DualShock 4 controller. I don't know, what do you think? Do you think a good way to make levels, perhaps, if it's easy and quick? And um, <laughs> or kludgy, yeah, I, I don't, don't know. know. Depends well, how easy it I, is. Yeah, that gets, a, that gets a big, big old remains to be seen on that front there. And You know, like I look at something like that, and I'm like, R really, that was created? I mean, s all right, sculpting is one thing. Animation, how do you set the bones and stuff like that, you know? Um, do they give you maybe a like, oh, well, this is a human shape, and then you kind of mold the shape, and you can select, you can write animations for bone structures, like maybe it's off motion capture. I, I kind of have a feeling that that demo is very much synthetic um, as far as a lot of a lot of that's concerned, you know. Um, yeah, well, we'll just make a demo and make it look like we did this in no amount of time. and <laughs> It seems too good to be true, but if, yeah, it, exactly. if it really so, works, then it could be I mean, I, I don't doubt that they've created something similar uh, in scope to, say, ZBrush, where you can do a sculpting-type process. Um, but in terms of things like animation and level design, now you're talking about adding programming elements to it um, and, and a lot more complex manipulations than just moving... 3D vertices around and how that plays out is going to be a, a very big question. So I'm definitely going to say we'll have to see. But I expect at some point some creative developer is going to come up with something pretty fun to do with it, um, probably within even the first year of PS4's release. So yeah, something something to watch out for. Um, it's interesting. I I. I had never really considered a Move controller or a PS3 because I'm a big fan of Kinect. But I still think having it in the controller is a little weird because I'm used to not having a controller with Kinect. But I suppose if it works well enough, then... Well, I, I see one advantage is, and especially in this sort of um, situation, is they can probably get a lot more precise control out of the controller than the Kinect can get. Yeah, sure, definitely. Um, yeah, and then obviously you're left with a single tool as well, which is a bit of a benefit. Um, so for things where you're talking about like tooling type applications like this or, you know, moving stuff around, I think that actually you're probably looking at it being a lot uh, more handy of a, of a tool than uh, Connect is. Where Connect is really putting your body into play, this is giving you a sort of real world manipulation tool. You know, for lack of a better word, it's a tool. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's cool, though. Um, I'm a little bit excited. I might want to get both a PS4 and a Yeah, I mean, I got to say, <laughs> it seems like a very good answer to the Kinect. Um, in terms of being both distinct and yet somewhat in the same vein, and um, probably lending itself to a different set of games, but maybe not completely excluding itself from what Kinect can do as well. Yeah, we'll have to see, but just take a little side trip down memory lane in terms of consoles. What what was your uh, first console, if, if you had one? I assume you did. Um, It's Back hard when. to say. I wasn't young enough really to catch the NES before the ad ad SNES came out, so I am not actually sure whether or not I had the NES or SNES first. Certainly I had 
I, I ended up donating the NES. Um, I never really played it that much, so I'd probably put my first console as the SNES. Um, and what follow, an followed after that? What would you get in the years to come? Anything, <laughs> anything good after that? Yeah, I mean, I was obviously never that big of a gamer, um, if that's not completely exemplified by the fact that I run Linux and I don't own an Xbox 360 or a PS3. Um, so my <laughs> consoles through the years... Oh, I did get a GameCube. I had a, um, I had a, a SNES, the NES that I mentioned I, I donated. Um, still have the SNES, along with uh, you know a few choice games, Zelda and Final Fantasy VI. Um, AK3. Let's see. But then I moved on to the. Uh, I skipped the P PS1 and I got an N64. Um, then I got a GameCube and a PS2 and then a Wii. That's basically my setup there. And a Wii. Oh. Yeah. You, do you still have the Wii? Still have the Wii. Just was playing Mar um, Mario Galaxy last night. <laughs> I kind of retired that game before I finished it, so I'm actually but I actually was about like one level from the end, if not no levels from the end, because I think at the point where I discontinued I could have jumped to Bowser since it you know lets you go without all the all the stars being completed. So did you get the um the newest Legend of Zelda for that one? Um Skyward Sword? Yeah Skyward Sword. I did get that um for Christmas along with my family um, so my, I watched my brothers play a good portion of it during the Christmas season last year. Have not gotten around to playing it, but since I've kind of brought my Wii out of retirement here, I probably will. Um, yeah, I want to finish that. I'm about halfway soon. through it. Uh, I've let the kids play it, but we haven't yeah, played it I'm, in months now. <laughs> I'm glad to see. I'm glad to see that they're stepping slightly away from cartoon Zelda, um, like they had with The Wind Waker, which was just way too cartoony yeah. for me, and yeah. I'm really, really glad that they are not um, using the boring as hell Zelda from um, from the, the game, the Game Boy uh, ports. Which, well, to me, oh, it, to me, it was more, it was more like a fallback onto, um, or a callback to the original NES uh, version. Which I love the original, the gold cartridge with the first, I think one of the first memory, memory cards that were built into the cartridge so you could save your game. I, I love that game. It was just awesome. And playing it just reminded me a lot of the elements, of the first one. I, I mean, I played, I played Link to the Past first, um, so it does bias me significantly. That remains probably my favorite, though Ocarina of Time definitely deserves a strong honorable mention second place, if not first as well. Um, I mean, I kind of, I kind of miss those games for their sort of cleanness, if you will. You know, um, they were nice because you were just there was no real styling, there was no weirdness. It was just. You walked around with a sword and you hit things, basically. Um, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think even Skyward Sword suffers from a lot of the design decisions that in, went into Wind Waker with some of the more stylized effects um, that they keep using. Uh, yeah, I don't know. It's just... Um, there's just something about it. I just don't really like the, the design aesthetic of it. Everything seems... Yeah, I just can't. I just can't really pin it down, but yeah. eh, still not in love with it. So, yeah, my first I, my first console was the Intellivision. That was in uh, probably 1984. I was nine years old. <laughs> it's a classic. Not, not to interrupt, but it does occur to me that probably technically my first console was actually the Game Boy original, um, which I did enjoy it profusely. The I monochrome? Remember. Was that the monochrome one? Yeah, except it wasn't even monochrome. It was more like the green and yellow green, one. Yeah, yeah, I had that yeah, one. Yeah, the was, huge one before they made the pocket. I remember the pocket coming yeah. out, um, and then the, the color. Yeah, that was that was probably my first, and I would play like Tetris. Um, yeah, I played the, Tetris nonstop on that guy. With, that the, uh, with the connection cable against people. Oh, um, uh, yeah. Sorry. I had a big family, and so one of the few I actually we actually did the um, the four-way cable, 
which they made, um, along with one of the only games that I think actually supported it really that we could find, which was, and of course that we could find being a very different landscape prior to the internet, um, which was F1 Race, I think it was called, um, which was a pretty weak racing game, um, but you could play with four people, so, you know, my family would bust out the four-way along with the one Game Boy Classic and, like, two pockets and uh, the Game Boy Color and, and play four ways on that, which is pretty awesome. I do yeah. remember playing Donkey Kong on the on the Game Boy Pocket, and I was like, damn, this screen is so much better. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, classic I, Game Boy screen was so bad. I wish I had kept my Game Boy. Or I wish I kept all my systems, really. There was a guy on eBay selling, uh, like, five or six systems with... Tons of games for five hundred thousand dollars. I don't know if he actually oh, wow. got five hundred thousand. Yeah, but, but I, I go yeah. back to in television, and then the Commodore sixty four being my my mainstay until like nineteen ninety three. Believe it or not, uh, it was my. That's that's pretty impressive. <laughs> I I had a color computer mixed in there, but I don't think I'd ever really call it my my primary. Along with the old Apple II was pretty much used by games since when I had it I wasn't really writing school reports or anything on it yeah I was I was doing my senior paper and stuff like that on my <laughs> Commodore 64 but I had the NES and then the Super NES Game yeah. Boy and then I got Dreamcast I skipped the uh, N64 Dreamcast jumped onto Xbox I haven't been off ever since so no I'm not a PS4 or a PlayStation fanboy Unfortunately, I, I'm not really an Xbox fanboy either. I still do a lot of PC gaming, 3D PC gaming, because there's still not a lot of titles that are on Xbox and 360, like Mass Effect 3, for instance, and uh, Skyrim. They don't play in, P in uh, 3D on the Xbox, unfortunately. But if you play them on the PC, you get some awesome 3D, which is cool and fun. And, uh, well, let's just jump ahead to the did I will say did they uh, make any statement about 3D for the PS4? Mm, I didn't really see any. Other yeah, than, I didn't other see than the 3D either. camera, but that's different. That's the PlayStation 4 I. That's this guy yeah. right here. I mean, I imagine they'll do 3D, but yeah, I was just curious if they said anything specifically about it. I would have to imagine too as well. But speaking of 3D, well, real 3D, I suppose you could say. Wearing some glasses and having a display pop right out at you and give you information in the real world 3D. Google Glass coming soon. And actually, the update says they're coming out by the end of the year to the public for under $1,500. Yeah, that's right. $1,500 for a pair of glasses. It's under $1,500, <laughs> Mark. Come oh, on. yeah, $1,499.99. <laughs> yeah, seriously, why do I not doubt that? <laughs> and, and they'll look like this, most likely, and they'll work with your existing glasses if you have glasses like myself. I don't do contacts. And, um, and then we have a little video here that is on the website. You can check it out. There's no audio here, so I'm just going to let it... Let it stream. Uh, the, um, there's a contest going on right now that will put the glass device in the hands of non-developers. Yeah, they, For they have a, the mere cost of, what, 700 bucks? Yeah, well, no, it's 1500 Oh, 1500 the yeah. They, yeah, still have to, are... they still have to pay the 1500 for the developer glasses that developers so currently ridiculous. have. I, I don't get that. I really don't. Yeah, but, I know. It's. I'm surprised more people aren't, like, just... Just no, but there you go. I guess it's it's pretty it's pretty awesome for Google side of things. They get to sell some pre-release stuff at probably well above cost and um, make back some of their R and D money, and they don't even have to hire testers to test them for them. Yeah, but you got to be above eighteen and over. Your deadline is February twenty seventh, so you've got like two days <laughs> to hurry up and do that. And this is for the Glass Explorer model. And that's known as the developer version, more expensive than a consumer version. Now they were saying originally that the consumer version would be around 750, but now the updated statement says under 1500 there'll be a version by the end of the year. Now maybe that's just like still a sort of developer version, but you can see from the yeah, video, I mean, the video I looks be pretty surprised. cool. I would love to have a pair of these because 
anybody out there that's watched Continuum Sci-Fi Station show is just awesome. She has a liquid chip put into her brain, which interfaces with her eyes, giving her a heads-up display, a la, you know, Google Glass kind of thing, where she can see fingerprints on the walls. Of course, the Google Glass won't have fingerprint detection or infrared or anything like that. But imagine the possibilities. We're seeing the beginnings of of wearable computing and um, visual mean, readout. It's pretty awesome. I'm I'm gonna have to go with I'll believe it when I see it. Um, I mean, right now it seems like there's just absolutely nothing to make it worthwhile, even at a three hundred dollar price point. Um, I mean, let alone fifteen hundred dollars. Just I mean, like when you think about it, in terms of having glasses on your face, and I wear glasses, so I don't like fit them over that. Okay. And then what's it what's it have to offer? You know, that's kind of the other yeah, thing. Yeah, it's kind of like having a remote view of your phone. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because <laughs> it's, really, it's, it's relying on your phone, in, in fact. And, you know, things that would take over that any day of the week, the watch version of things, literally one-tenth of the price, and uh, yeah, yeah. in I a watch. more convenient place on my body that it can store more battery without being in more comfortable. So, well, like... If you want to be inconspicuous and walk up to somebody and you don't have information on them, you don't know who they are. With you blatantly use Google obvious to... <laughs> Google freaking glasses on your face. <laughs> oh, eventually they'll blend in, I'm sure, and you won't be able to tell a person's wearing them. That's the future. Maybe, eventually being like 10 years. And, you know, all right, are probably in more fairness four or five years, I can see, since, I mean, it's not like they're probably putting the development version out for Christmas, so... You know how long is it going to take them to get development version Rev two out, and then then and, start and then stylizing the, it? Then the Google chip implant that goes inside you. Yeah, the, exactly. The liquid so, chip. <laughs> you know, I mean, the sci-fi angle's cool and all, but you know, I I don't think that even augmented reality apps have delivered um, as far as using the camera on the phone um, for being anything but just little little fun things. So. You know, when you're talking about a $15 price point and having to wear something, you, you, there's a lot of utility that's kind of mandated to go along with that. Um, unless you've really got a lot of money to burn and are into gadgets, it's just kind of... Yeah. yeah. Well, As I said, I mean, the watch... I don't really think the watch is a great thing, but I mean, I, I think it's orders of magnitude better than this. Not only being, it's ten times as useful at one tenth the price, you know. Yeah, I, I could definitely see using the watch if you don't feel like whipping your phone out. Just uh, look up some quick information on your on your watch, which really is an extension of your phone. But uh, yeah, exactly. I mean, like, all right, I can. I, I mean, I don't really have a problem pulling my phone out of my pocket, but I can really see where, you know, if you get a a text message or a phone call or something, it wouldn't be bad that you could. Like, for your phone call, look at your watch and be like, oh, yeah, I don't want to talk to that person now. Mute. You know? Yeah. yeah. You could probably feel the, a vibrator better if it came from your wrist. There's another thought. I mean, I can see merits to the watch. I think that they run kind of overpriced and underfeatured right now, but um, I see that a lot more beneficial than than the glasses for at least the foreseeable future. Well, let's uh, well, let's move on. Uh, to some science real quick here and the uh, there's two good stories here I would I would assume we should probably cover I had three of them but let's just pick two first one cold fusion oh yeah it's still real apparently um, the cold fusion dream lives on NASA is developing cheap clean low energy nuclear reaction technology called LENR that could eventually see cars planes and homes powered by small safe nuclear reactors that might just blow up at any point. Well, not quite. They're safe. Um, so, have you checked this out, Dylan? Um, I have not. No. Yeah, they're um, talking about um, fusion, uh, creating vast amounts of energy by fusing atoms of hydrogen together. Um, we're still far off from doing that on a large scale in commercial fusion reactors, but LENR is nothing like fission or fusion where fission and fusion are are underpinned by the strong nuclear force LENR harnesses power from the weak nuclear force but capturing the energy is the difficult 
part, and NASA's best effort so far has been using a nickel lattice and hydrogen ions, where the hydrogen ions are sucked into the nickel lattice. Then the lattice is oscillated at a very high frequency, and the oscillation excites the nickel's electrons, which are forced into the hydrogen ions, uh, forming slow-moving neutrons. The nickel immediately absorbs the neutrons, making it unstable. To regain the unstable, the stability the nickel strips a neutron of its electron so that it becomes a proton and a reaction that turns a nickel into copper and creates a lot of energy in the process that's a lot to process in itself right there <laughs> but uh, that's what they are looking to use in their LENR or Lenner process yeah, I, I don't really, I, I'm not up on the latest and greatest as far as that's concerned. I mean, you know, it's unlike a lot of the um, perpetual motion devices you see around, cold fusion technically works. Um, there are methods of accomplishing it. Uh, a muon catalyzed uh, um, fusion is a well known possibility where basically the heavier muon allows uh, two hydrogen atoms to get a lot closer and close enough to um, a fuse versus an electron. The only trouble is that it takes a lot more energy to make muons than it does to than you get out of the um, fusion process. So in theory, if we could create muons, um, which are light electrons, or the heavier versions of electrons, sorry, um, then it wouldn't be that hard to uh, have workable uh, cold fusion. Well that's, the only well, that's what they're talking about here with the nickel, because they're stating that about 1% of the world's nickel production could meet the world's energy needs a quarter of the cost of coal, but right now they're, they're using more energy to create the reaction than they are getting it, so it's not efficient right now. Yeah, exactly. So unlike perpetual motion devices and stuff, like... The theory here is sound. It's just a lot of kind of trying to solve certain engineering and efficiency issues, which, I mean, I don't mean to understate are significant, but, you know, there are also ways, you know, there's nothing, abs there's absolutely nothing saying that you can't do it. So it is something that deserves research, and it's nice to see that the stigma has kind of drifted a little bit away from that, and they're continuing to research it. I'm not going to say that this particular method has any particular potential, but yeah, they've um, blown they've blown up several labs in the process, <laughs> so they're at least working on it. They're they're trying to uh, work on yeah, it. Yeah, so you know we'll wait and see. Yeah, Don't we'll hold your see. breath, but at the same time, um, it's somewhat more promising technology than the Tokamak is. So <laughs> yeah. there you go. You know what's even more promising than the cold fusion, actually, that many people don't think about too often is actually putting a solar array on the moon and pretty much wrapping the moon in a solar array and then sending that energy back to earth micro uh, i microwave. mean you know when it comes down to it that always sounds fun but realistically there's basically no advantage to doing that over just putting solar panels on earth well, there I mean, is, there is, because you don't have an atmosphere to contend to, so the solar plant panels can be thinner, and they don't cost as much to make. The problem is that we're not already on the moon, we don't have a base on the moon, and there are many proponents that say that if we put these solar panels on the moon, that we could meet the world's energy needs by having the uh, solar panels on the moon. Yeah, but I mean, we could meet the world's energy needs by putting solar panels on Earth. I mean, like, and, and keep in mind that the... The moon's not exactly the nicest condition. It's even though it doesn't have an atmosphere, dust still can get stirred up and cover things. Um, solar winds and asteroid collisions and stuff like that. Apophis um, is coming too, so yeah, that's true. What's that? <laughs> Apophis, the uh, yeah, asteroid that's coming in uh, 2030, 2019, 2036, I think, coming. Yeah. Uh, twice. So I mean, you know, <laughs> and like that comet's gonna probably, if it gets close enough, dump a bunch of dust on it. So that combined with the oh, inefficiency of the... It's not getting that close, but yeah. yeah. Uh, how Sorry. far is it going to be? Like, just really far? <laughs> millions and millions of miles. Okay. A, lot, a lot further than uh, the 230 uh, 
what, 9,000 miles? To okay, Maryland. for some reason they got the impression it was going to be slightly close. It's um, going to be very big in the sky, though, with a 40 million mile long tail. That's what makes it so impressive, I think. Yeah. Um, but anyway, I mean, when you just couple the efficiency losses of the transmission to Earth with any sort of gains that you gain from losing the atmosphere, it's just not worth the effort, you know? And the idea that you could make them thinner, like, ugh, what's the point? I mean, it's not like crystalline silicon is that expensive. It's just so much else, the, the cost. Like, when you consider buying solar panels for your house, like, it's already basically about a dollar a watt in terms of the solar panels themselves. Um, but when you go to install it with the AC to DC converters, the actual physical installation all the upkeep, the batteries, then you're up at $5 a watt. So if you consider the fact that the main cost of putting solar panels just on Earth is the installation, like, I, the idea that putting them on the moon and that somehow makes it cheaper is just preposterous. Well, I'll, t I'll tell the you who's... Um, i got to tell you who's uh, actually proposing this just so that we're, I'm not making up wind here so to speak no, I don't, yeah. uh, it's it, the person's name uh, that came up with or is proposing this is David Criswell a director for the Institute of Space Systems Operations at the University of Houston and he you know says that building solar power stations on the moon could fulfill the energy needs of the whole world and we would beam the energy back using low intensity microwaves and yeah, but the word is the word there is could. I mean, could it happen? Yes, it could happen. Well, should it happen? Uh, Does it make any friggin' sense at all? No. <laughs> the, the moon has cool. no atmosphere, no wind, yeah. rain, fog, weather of any kind. So it's a perfect place to you know gather solar energy as opposed to Earth because it's constantly lit, except for brief. Uh, lunar uh, eclipses, of course. Right, and except for the other sides of the moon, it's not like every surface of the moon is always lit. I mean, the moon is tidally locked with Earth, not the sun. So the moon has day-night cycles as well, so you have to contend with the fact that certain parts of the moon are only going to be drawing power at given points of the day. So... Whereas on Earth, at least that day-night cycle it coincides with a natural human rhythm. On the moon, it's a much more goofy period, and you've got to contend with that. So now you probably have to put like twice as many solar panels out there because you have to deal with long periods of dark that don't naturally match... Um, yeah, but they're Earth's lighter like, and easier to make, assuming you're already on the moon. But assuming course, you're making them on the moon, maybe. yeah, that's that's the whole point. But you're I making mean, like, them on the moon. You have factories on the moon, but then you need ten thousand large receivers. And all again, over the world. I'm going to put out there that this guy probably has no idea what the hell he's talking about. And I know that that sounds weird from just some random podcaster, but I mean, lighter and easier to make is crazy when it comes to the solar panels. They're already wafer thin, literally wafer thin. I mean, they're wafers. Like, what makes them expensive is having to put them in boxes, having to put the boxes on roofs, having to wire all the boxes together, having to convert the energy into another form, having to store the energy for cycles, etc., etc. I mean, literally, the solar panels themselves are just a small fraction of the cost. Making them thinner is pointless. I mean, it's just such a, a meaningless concept. I mean, hell, they already make thin film solar panels, which are just basically a couple of materials evaporated on the glass. It's just that they're rare earths, so they're more expensive materials. Like, I mean, there's just so much that just is not, there's well, just no point to it. He also states the moon receives about 13,000 terawatts of solar power, and harnessing just 1% could satisfy the earth's power needs. That's well, one of, one of his Jupiter uh, probably questions. receives that much, too. <laughs> I'm not... And, you know, I bet yeah, I bet if you put them on Mercury, you could really get a lot of power out of it. Like, it's just, it's not, it, you know, it's just not practical, and there's no reason for it. Like, it's great if you've got a moon base to put solar panels on the moon. I'm cool with that. I'm cool with having a moon base. But we don't need a terawatt, like, radiation beam booming down to, from the Earth and then having to distribute that to all the houses when we can just put the damn solar panels on a house. Like, right now. We can do that right now. 
<laughs> for for a fairly yeah. expensive chunk, though. But yeah. it, it's come down a lot in the last few years. It's come down a lot, and as I said, when you look at the cost, the solar panels themselves are meaningless. Like they don't actually have that much cost associated with them. The final the final tally is far more decided by the physical installation and the support systems for it. Like a kilowatt solar panel might cost you like a thousand, two thousand dollars, cost you two thousand dollars to install, cost you five hundred dollars for the power inverter, cost you five hundred dollars for the batteries. You know, I mean, like yeah, that's yeah. A, that's a lot of the, the batteries are yeah, batteries are a big factor. Yeah, I mean, so that's, that's like it. that's the thing. So, you know, all right, yeah, maybe you could save like fifty cents. So instead of paying a like you know, a couple dollars, of, like a two dollars a watt, you could pay maybe a dollar a watt on the moon in terms of solar panel production because, yeah, you don't have an atmosphere and you could align it more favorably to the sun, whatever, around the equator of the moon because you don't have to worry about oceans. But, like, you know, now you have to build power transmission infrastructure on the moon. You have to build your big receiving station. You have to build your big transmitting station. You have to build your big power converter for the transmitter, build a big power converter for the receiver, and have to wire up the whole nation off these stations and there's no way one station's going to be able to handle it and talk about a terrorist target so now you got to have like about like oh I don't know like 100 200 stations all beaming down from the moon and you know you have to worry about synchronizing the moon I mean at least it's tightly locked but that doesn't mean anything in terms of like precision uh, I mean you don't want your beam pattern to be like so uh, it's just all the impracticality is ridiculous it's not even worth discussing Put the panels on the moon, and, or put the panels on a house and be done with it. The power's right there. And then you have a high-voltage DC power supply. You could be great for charging your frigging car. Like, then you don't even have to worry about a power converter. Like, that's half the problem that could be solved with solar panels, is if you just make houses DC, then you don't have to worry about big inverters and stuff like that. Except maybe for fridge motors, which could go DC, but, you know, whatever. It doesn't matter that much. So, I mean, it's just like, I don't even know why this has to be topic for discussion. Moon is cool. I want to base there. Yes, that would be great. But, like... Well, I agree. In fact, why not put tons of solar arrays in, like, the uh, deserts? Sahara, for instance. We could yeah, be exactly. harnessing power there. and uh, It's yeah. like, I get, I get that it's less efficient, but, you know, it's a lot easier to deal with, like, maintenance issues and all that sort of stuff. What if, like, you're you start getting tin whiskers on your solar panel solder joints. Like, now all of a sudden you've got issues. I mean... Meteorite impacts get, and Meteorite uh, impacts, sure. solar, wind, dust. I mean, you know, that's not something that you can just forget. The fact that, I mean, keep in mind that when you're looking at doped silicon, you're talking about, like, impurities to the 10 to the minus 9 quantities. Like, uh, the parts per parts per billion. So, like... Uh, it varies. I don't know what it is for solar panels, but, you know, we'll figure it's parts per billion. How much are high-energy proton impacts from the sun's radiation going to impact that? Like, you can't sit here and tell me that something is going to have necessarily the same lifetime as it's going to have on the Earth when the Earth's shielded from radiation. So, are you shielding your solar panels from high-energy radiation? I'm going to guess no. So how long do they last under the bombardment of solar radiation? Do they last all the same 30 years that they supposedly last on Earth? Do they only last five years? Does anyone have any friggin' clue? Or are we just talking about installing solar panels on the moon because it sounds cool? You know yeah, what I'm saying? Not, not only solar radiation, but you have uh, other inner space radiation such as gamma rays and other things. I don't know well, if they that's affect all, that's panels That's what I mean not, by solar is usually yeah. most of that comes from the sun. I mean, I, if we get hit by a gamma ray burst, you know, whatever, we're all dead anyway. So, <laughs> yeah, I mean, gamma rays are the least interesting. It's the high energy protons and other and neutrons and stuff from the solar wind that starts to be meaningful. I mean, obviously, satellites, you know, they hang out pretty well. Um, Cosmic rays. That's what I meant. Yeah, I mean, the, gamma rays. The, <laughs> gamma yeah. rays would be bad. That comes from a um, supernova. If there's one I nearby, mean, we're screwed. Satellites are pretty good. Um, I'm not really sure what the expected lifetime of satellite solar panels is versus radiation. Uh, I'm not sure what level of shielding they use. Uh, how they compare cost-wise to Earth panels. Like you know, it's it's a whole ball of wax that's really just unnecessary since the technology is fine installed on the ground on earth 
You yeah. know, it's just and if the day comes just, we have a moon base, then it becomes something to really consider. But for now, no, I mean, yeah. even even then, like even then, why are you beaming freaking that's true? Yeah, of, yeah that's true. To Earth. <laughs> you're beaming it like, back instead that's, of that's. The, there's no way you're going to be t- telling me that that's like even 90% efficient, that beaming. It's probably a lot closer to about I t- like... At 10%, I think, is some of the stats that have yeah, been floating around. Yeah, exactly. That. So you're going to try to tell me that the moon can harvest 10 times more energy than a solar panel on Earth? Like, maybe, whatever. It's it's not worth it. It's just so not worth it. <laughs> it's going to be far more expensive to install them on the moon than it is your house. <laughs> Call it a day. <laughs> You know, yeah, yeah uh, I, I found it to be kind of interesting, and and the other interesting fact is how important the moon is to the Earth. If the the moon is receding, it's moving away from the Earth, and if it were to move ten percent further away from the Earth, we would have a wobble to the Earth that is would cause extreme weather from one one end to the other. In one case, in the same location, you would have freezing cold Antarctic-type weather. And then the other time of the year, you might have blazing hot 200, or not 200, but 150 degree, hotter than the hottest desert currently-type weather. That's the uh, importance of the moon, or at least one importance of the moon. And so any guesses to how long it's going to take for it to slip away by 10%? I believe the answer is longer than life will be on Earth. <laughs> yeah, it's about one billion years from now. Yeah, I've seen estimates that Earth only has about 500 million before uh, the atmosphere is burned away by an increasingly hot sun. So, by then we'll uh, be we'll be uh, elsewhere and maybe first. Yeah, I mean, who the, knows? You might be welcoming the the wobble in the Arctic rays when the sun's like burning off <laughs> parts of the planet. So. Well, by 2018, founder-led millionaire Dennis Tito and the first space tourist in 2001 is going to uh, propose sending two astronauts to Mars by 2018, and he's going to announce this officially in two days on February 27th. It will be a 501-day round-trip mission. That's like one and three-quarter years launching in 2008. And these two astronauts will take sponge baths, (laughs) live in a very small capsule, Probably using the dragon, uh, red dragon capsule from SpaceX, most likely. And uh, not stop at Mars, but keep on going, like a boomerang, I suppose you could say. And come right back. <laughs> and uh, But they would be the first to make it outside of uh, low Earth orbit since, say, the uh, Apollo missions in the 60s. Well, not the 60s the uh, 72 since we went to the moon and something similar to that of the Apollo 7 mission of 1968 uh, though it didn't actually go into orbit around the moon it just came back it's it's a curious venture I don't really I mean if you're going to put two people in a box for like two years why would you have them not land you know um, yeah that's the well, I mean, cost. Or pro- I don't right. understand what the uh, impetus here is. Are we just setting the stage, saying here, let's, let's see like how that's it- see that's what I could. Only, that's the only justification I can give is that you know they, it's it's a proof of concept. There's always a lot of doubt. Like, oh well, you know, we don't know if people can stand that long. We don't know if we want to have. You know, blah blah blah. Obviously, landing is a huge additional risk and effort. I don't th- think that it's huge to the point of this making a whole lot of sense. It seems like you know. Yeah, it's it's like they're trying to do the the Russian Mars 500 mock mission all over again that ended in 2011. Yeah, yeah let's exactly. just send two guys and see if they tear themselves apart before they get there and, and come you know, back. I and mean, <laughs> like, don't get me wrong. I can see the benefit to the study, but. It also strikes me as the fact of the matter is, if you're going to go through that study, why not just have them, like, step foot on the thing, put a launch a launcher together? Eh, I mean, you know, it's definitely there's weight, there's cost. Fair yeah, enough. Added but, cost and complexity. and. But, you know, let's put it this way. Yeah. If they tear each other apart after, like... <laughs> 
350 days, at least it or, landed on Mars. <laughs> or they, know? you know, they come back with Alzheimer's from the cosmic radiation, which studies have shown that they could get Alzheimer's from. You would yeah, hope that exactly. they're going to put. Like, hopefully, they'll come up with some kind of shielding on on the uh, capsule. Right, and that's what I'm think. saying. Like, I can see why there's merit to the study in that regard. Like, studying actual de- being out there, the extent of what sort of internet they could get, and how, you know, what sort of entertainment, and whether or not they could really be kept sane for that long. <laughs> Um, you know, versus the Russian thing, where it's hard to. Re- I'm not familiar with what sort of limitations they put on it. And how, like, life support and stuff. So I'm not... And then, obviously, there's the this gravity question as far as can they stay healthy over that period of time. A lot of good questions that can be answered from it. But, again, it just strikes me as kind of an odd sort of halfway to decide, well, we'll send them all the way to Mars and make them spend two years of time doing it and, you know, not to put together a, a lander to um, have them land there. Uh, I don't know. But yeah, the, the uh, capsule, incidentally, just just for record here, this is what it looks like. That's not a very big picture. Sorry. Um, let's see if I can make it bigger. It looks something like this, at least in its current iteration. Not a whole lot of room. I, I would. They, they have to send them in something bigger than just that, I would think, but. Maybe not. <laughs> no, hey, no. You're going to spend a year and three quarters. That's a little crazy. But we'll see. We got the the one, the Mars one coming up at the end of the year. Start yeah. Voting to look no, forward to. I mean, it's it's interesting. And we'll even see if it happens. That's always the thing. Like, they like to propose lofty ideas. And maybe someone will just say, you know, really, guys, if you're going to send someone out there, you might as well at least have them set foot on another planet and, um, yeah, you know, get that sort of record accomplished because no one's going to look back in the history books and be like well these two guys went on the joyride yeah. two years that's, <laughs> yeah that's one small no not quite small trip for mankind yeah that was one long ass <laughs> trip, long for trip. Man. <laughs> and didn't do anything and one whole lot of nothing for mankind <laughs> <laughs> they, took a, they took a picture with their polari- polaroid and kept on going I mean here I have a great plan <laughs> Here's what they can do. They can send them out with a feather duster and they can go dust off old opportunity and spirit there and uh, we can get another couple of years out out of them. Yeah. As I seem to recall, that's why they died. So there you go. That'd be productive. You could probably well, get NASA to throw in a million bucks for that. I think one of them is still still kicking, but yeah, they could they could go down there and give them a little give them a little extra boost. Maybe yeah, I, f- I forget what their <laughs> ultimate fates were. I think like opportunity got dusty enough and they can't squeeze you anymore that it can't get enough power to move so it's just basically sitting there recording weather data or something and then like spirit exploded or something I don't really remember not actually exploded well I don't think it exploded but but yeah I haven't heard from that from <laughs> for a while so I'm not sure what happened to it but I, I do recall that the dust on the solar panel was kind of an issue that they ran into since it's apparently pretty sticky so yeah, yeah. I mean you know Swiffer send up send them some Swiffers <laughs> yeah, well, it's going to be an exciting time coming up here in the next few years. So, the sooner the better. Yeah, I mean, I think, one way or the I other. Think, yeah, sometime in the next decade, we'll probably see some action on Mars in terms of humans on Mars. Um, but I, I think that any anything putting it within 2020 of Mars is probably unrealistic, just given all the all the issues that one faces um, in regards to from anywhere from ethics to practicality and cost. It just doesn't seem like the world is really ready at this point to actually send someone to Mars. Which is a little bit sad, but... yeah, It'll happen. Yeah, eventually. I mean, you know, the, the nice thing is is that it's not it's not like, you know, some of those probes that they send out where they send it out and it's ten years before you even hear back from it. So it's nice that at least we have the uh, the solace knowing that, you know, it's probably going to take them five to ten years to develop a mission for it. But at the very least, it'll happen pretty quick after after they're ready to launch. Fingers yeah, 2018 crossed. is the prime target for a trajectory, but after that, it's 2031. So let's hope for 2018, yeah. uh, unless we got some so, bigger engines coming along here with one of these other planned missions 
or hopeful yeah, missions, I should exactly. say. Yeah, exactly. So I guess, I don't know, maybe, maybe that's just the idea is that it's it's coming up so soon now that they're not going to have time to g put together anything much but a box to send some people in, so yeah. <laughs> they probably figure they can't get a lander scrounged together before in the next five years, which not unreal, not really unreasonable. It's a couple of people. Kind of surprising. A couple of people in a VW Beetle. That's the equivalent. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's kind of surprising that no one decided to, you know, plan for this ten years ago and be like, hey, you know, we're going to have a good Mars launch opportunity in 2018. We should probably be ready with some technology um, to well, maybe make something happen. De Dennis Tito had to get his uh, his own exploration out of the way in 2001. That took some time. And then he had to find the inspiration... Uh, Mars Foundation, so... Yeah, but, I mean, that's him. Yeah. You know, that's not <laughs> everyone in the world. Yeah, there's lots of other opportunities, of other companies coming forward now. And yeah, Elon Musk or even... And SpaceX. Or even, like, NASA, for that matter. Let's get some irons in the fire, but... Eh. Yeah. Oh, well. Oh, well. I mean, I don't think, realistically, it makes a whole lot of sense to, in, in the grand scheme of things, to be um, exposed needing the prime launch target time layout in order to make a trip to Mars and back because I think that's really just ultimately something that's going to be a little bit too constraining to for decent exploration but you know sadly the 2030 timeline does sound about what people are on so maybe yeah. that might be a, a deadline as good as any well we've reached our deadline and yep. that's all the news stories we've got this week and topics so uh, so, but uh, I guess that's going to wrap up today's show. And, of course, remember to keep on cooking with tech. And hopefully you don't fry your tech if you're cooking with it. But uh, <laughs> we will see you next time on uh, TechStew.